Yeah, just let me know. Okay, well, I'm on my cell phone. I apologize for that. Um, it's the best I can do at this point. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I don't know if you can. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're, we're, I think we're live right now. Okay, I can hear you and I apologize for all this. For those of you who've already joined us, uh, I have had technical issues, I, forgive me for that, but please welcome to the Morning Scoop presented by the Arizona Capital Times. Prop 400 is expiring. What does it mean to Metro Phoenix? I'm Steve Goldstein, our panelists this morning. Avondale Mayor Ken Weiss, the Maricopa Association of Governments Regional Council. Sintra Hoffman, President and CEO of Westmark. We also have John Lewis, President and CEO of East Valley Partnership and Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all of you, and thank you very much for putting up with my strange technical difficulties. <laughs> Mayor Weiss, let me start with you. Um, there are so many things that Prop 400 has accomplished mm -hmm. over the years. I wonder if you could give us some examples, and that could be in the realm of freeways. It could be in the realm of public transit. Uh, and if we could talk about some of the more recent projects and some of the impact it has had over the entire valley. Sure. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to see everyone up bright and early. Um, you know, I, I think, Steve, as, as we talk about this, I think it's important to kind of frame what Prop 400E is, but that's important, but also how did we get here? So um, early 80s, Valley leadership decided and knew we had an issue um, with freeways. There just wasn't a cohesive freeway system, and they knew for the Valley to be competitive and grow economically that we needed to have a, an investment strategy. They also knew that each city couldn't do that alone. So they put together a municipal planning organization, an MPO, which essentially is Maricopa Association of Governments, to put forth the first prop, which was Prop 300. And that was pretty much strictly freeways. And you saw um, you know, I-10, you saw the 101, you saw a lot of investments in roads and freeways. Fast forward from 1985 to uh, 2004, it's a 20-year plan. And MAG puts together another transit plan called Prop 400, which would expand the freeway system to include uh, the 202, the 303, um, SR24 in the East Valley, uh, improvements on the 101 widening projects. Do you see the project from the 202 from Chandler going through Phoenix connecting um, in, in, in the West Valley? And along with those freeway investments, you saw uh, investments in transit, in light rail. You saw investments in regional roads of significance. And that's kind of where we're at. So if you look at the numbers, um, Prop 400 built 410 new corridor miles of freeway, 410 across the entire valley area, 252 miles of street projects. Think about that, 252 miles, and then expanded bus service and also uh, light rail. So, you know, some of the projects that we talk about that are happening currently, you could see if anybody drives along the Broadway curve, you could see that project getting done. We're getting ready and we've made improvements along the entire I-17 corridor. You know, one of the big things we've heard about over the last year, year and a half is uh, Taiwan Semiconductor coming into the valley. Thousands of employees going to work there. We need to improve the roads there. And I, you see those with off ramp improvements. You see that along the I-17 and the uh, 101. But just are, those are just a few of those projects that we talk about. Terrific. And, and Central Hoffman, let me ask you specifically, we're going to do a broader overview of, the, of this, obviously. I want to ask you specifically about the West Valley. You have been involved in this for a couple of decades. What are the differences you've seen in the West Valley and the importance of Proposition 400 to that and also serving a diverse population in the West Valley? Uh, thanks, Steve. And um, thanks for having me here. It's exciting to talk about one of my favorite topics, with, which is transportation. Not only is it about getting around, but it's about economic development. So I moved to the Valley in 1999. And at the time, uh, Loop 101 was not connected to I-10. So it ended at Glendale Avenue. And then you kind of had to get off and do this weird jog. And that was, uh, I think, a leftover from, um, from Prop 300. So Prop 300 really was about mobility. Um, the last link of I-10 um, across the valley or across Arizona was completed in 1990. And that sounds really late if you think about the way the rest of the nation um, has, has developed and, and all of the opportunities, job opportunities that we have there. 
So I, I, I think, you know, living in the, in the West Valley and living in Arizona for the last almost 24 years, 25 years, I've definitely seen uh, an incredible growth in our transportation system and, as well as our economic development system. But I would say I'm seeing the growth or I've, we've experienced the growth in this region um, in economic development because of uh, the investments in transportation. Um, I don't know if, if many people know, but I used to work for ADOT and I worked for ADOT for uh, close to seven years. And during that time, we went around the state talking about the investment in transportation really being the backbone of economic development. And that that's exactly what it is. We've seen uh, a huge amount of residents move to the region in both East and West Valley, they kind of moved out of the central core, the drive to qualify, if you will, um, but no real jobs for them. And so I think a lot of the transportation investments back then was really to just get people into the central core through freeways and, and materials. And now uh, I think that the need has really evolved into with uh, those jobs, with the freeways being the, the the basis for creating those jobs, companies like TSMC coming in, the Loop 303 with all of those companies coming on, have been in along the Loop 303. That's providing local jobs. The same thing in the East Valley, and I know John's gonna hit on this, but um, we're all seeing jobs being created in our local communities. So where we're going to in our, I, I would say, you know, the next uh, 20 year iteration of this transportation investment is really more in that need for uh, for transit and getting people around in our, in our own communities. John Lewis, let's talk specifically about the East Valley as Central alluded to. Uh, the develop, developments that have happened there. And that's obviously been an area where we think about Mesa in particular that has taken advantage of light rail, but also freeway expansion as well. Uh, East Valley seems to be a real great example of, of where Prop 400 has had an impact in many different areas. Steve, I start. Sintra uh, <clears throat> caused some memory of I did. <laughs> I, I've also lived through this and some of the figures that Mayor Weiss shared. This has just been a remarkable return on investment for the valley and i arrived in the early 80s and i'll just make a comment about that and then allude to some of the things that have happened in the early 80s um, we were experiencing great growth in the greater phoenix area there had been a lot of growth in the 70s but the 80s started and all of a sudden uh, the 1.5 million residents in greater phoenix was expanding rapidly and just an example of that by the year 2000 20 years later, we were up to 3 million. So it doubled in size. And in the early 80s, that growth was starting in the East Valley. And at that time, there was really only one way to get around in the Valley. And it was very crowded. And we did have um, plans, but it was going to be many, many years uh, in, in the making. And so interesting note, the East Valley partnership that I am part of started in 1982 because business leaders in the East Valley were frustrated that we had a very poor transportation infrastructure. And that was the major advocacy that started the partnership to say, we need to get working together. And with that, when it came time for the vote on Prop 300, uh, citizens are ready. And initially, I think it was a very focused quality of life. And, and so, uh, the vote passed is 72% uh, favorable, and we were off and running. And I, I think the first few years, it really did seem like it was quality of life. And then all of a sudden, where the freeways were being built, economic development took off. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about the entire valley, but to your question, Steve, I'll just quickly say that when you look at over the last 20 years, that return on investment that continued uh, what has happened, I, I think, of Tempe Town Lakes on the 202. I mm -hmm. think in Mesa of both north Northwest Mesa on the 202, the Wrigleyville area, and then coming all the way down to Southeast, uh, the Gateway Airport, all that's happened there. And there's a technology corridor that now has Meta and Google and Apple, all tied to this transportation infrastructure that was a, a great return on investment. We look at what happened with Gilbert on the 202 and you go to every exit from Gilbert uh, to Higley and there's 
major projects we could talk about. And even on the Superstition Freeway, we talk about Banner and the MD Anderson um, Higley Gilbert uh, f campus. We go down to Mercy Gilbert and all that's happened at Val Vista in the 202. And then one of the great stories in the early uh, days of, of this uh, planning for future uh, freeways, the Chandler city leaders envisioned a price corridor hmm. that would lead down to Intel and have businesses all the way down the price corridor and on the 101. And, and all of a sudden we have economic development that I'm not sure what adjective to use. I'll just say astonishing. The last thing I would mention is all these little communities, mid eighties, Queen Creek is a few hundred people. And now we're at 70,000 and with the SR24 being built in the last few years, one of the major announcements, and this was uh, for Governor Hobbs on the international state of the state that she did at the end of March, uh, her, her feature message as far as a company was LG Energy. And LG Energy with their ability uh, with transportation means to get uh, goods and, and employees, they announced that they were going to expand their 1.5 billion uh, project to 5.5 billion. Hmm. And that has everything to do again with transportation. And so the economic development return for the Valley, East Valley, Central Phoenix, West Valley has just been amazing. And, and I, since I just want to jump to the West Valley for a minute and so um, amazed at everything that's happened in the last maybe 10 years, but I'll say 22 in the West Valley has been uh, tied so much to transportation and the leadership that's been put in by local leaders to focus on the economic development. And so uh, it just gets better every day. I find it yeah. fascinating for both of you and, and obviously Mayor Weiss in this as well, that in the big picture of the history of the world, a couple of decades isn't very much time. And to think about how much has expanded in direct accord with Proposition 400, you know, the course of 20 years for us may seem like a lot, it's a quarter of our lives, but in the big picture, it's not much. And to think about the impact that was there that has been made and what the Valley would look like without the money from Proposition 400, probably not something any of us really want to want to think about at this point. Well, um, Steve, yes, sorry, Mayor Rice, go ahead. you know, John and Centra talk about economic development and growth, and, and we've seen it in the East Valley, we've seen it in the Central Core, and obviously in the West Valley, but projections are that um, by the time that Prop 400 East plan is over, so we're talking about 20 years, you're looking at the population west of I-17, which is probably right now around 1.7 million people by all accounts, Eight. will double to 3.4, 3.5 million people. And you think about that. So we have a metro area of 4.5, 4.6 million people. Picture that metro area being eight or nine million people. Right. And if we're impressed by the economic development we've seen over the last 20 years, I can't wait to see what 20 years in the future looks like, um, especially especially in the West Valley, but building on the success that the East Valley has had and the Central Core has had. I risk going behind yeah. the curtain again here because of my technical issues. Todd Sanders, are you with us? I am, yes. Okay, Thank Todd, you. well, let me, there's been so much discussion of economic development. I don't want to miss out on what the, what the chamber and how involved uh, the chamber is with this. So as we have diversified the state's economy, which I, I've lived here for, 45 years, so I've seen a lot of change, and I realized that for a while it was, well, this is about tourism, certainly a major part of what we have here, but the mention of TSMC, the mention of the expansion of Intel, what's going on in the West Valley, there are so many more people and so many different kinds of people to serve. How much does transportation Proposition 400 mean for expanding the, the base of businesses we have here and actually serving the people from CEO down to folks who are hourly workers? No, no I think it's a great question. I think um, John's, the, the imagery that he brought forward in his time in, in the Valley, sort of the East Valley, and then even in the West, really tells that picture in, in such an important way. But if you, if you look at, for instance, just, just you know, 2008 till today, the Great Recession, we all remember what happened. Um, and we really had an economy that wasn't very diverse. We decided we needed to diversify that economy, have a much bigger base. Now, it, when we have downturns, um, nationally, Arizona does much better. We're seeing that now. Um, and that is because we have a diverse economy. And that does go back to really intentional thinking about the economy. And part of that, obviously, is a, is a, is a transportation system that works not just today, and to, to Mayor Weiss's point, but it's going to work 
20 years into the future. So thinking about Maricopa County, right, the, the, the fastest growing county in the country, I looked this up, um, economic power. The economic, the GDP of Maricopa County is equal to that of New Zealand. Okay, so this is a significant player. Uh, talking to Chris Camacho at GPEC, we're a tier one city. That means that if something happens here in Arizona, it sends ripple effects across the country. We impact the rest of the country. Now, we've been doing that in a very positive way, but if we do something to sort of undermine those fundamentals, we can have some problems. Now, speaking of what's what's happened here and, and that growth, um, the, the massive... Um, change we've seen, for instance, is in healthcare, financial services. Well, in just the last 10 years, 100,000 new jobs in that sector, uh, about 60,000 uh, for financial services, same kinds of increases in construction um, and contracting services. And then, of course, you mentioned TSMC. I mean, that's a, well, I think it started out to be 50, uh, 15 billion, now $40 billion at the intersection of what? The, 10, the, the 303 and I-17 because we had a plan and we had some thoughts about, all right, we're, gonna, we're, we're great today, but what about tomorrow? Thank God we thought about that 20 years ago and made those investments because look, look at the payoff that occurred. Now, TSMC is great, that's a huge investment, but we've been talking to uh, supplier after supplier after supplier that's coming in from the rest of the country or Taiwan to set up businesses here, uh, to set up shops to supply, not only them, but Intel, those people, the folks that he had TSMC and all of these, for instance, 100,000 workers in the healthcare industry, they need to move around. They need to move around in our freeways, our arterials. They need to move around in our in our in our buses and our light rail. All of that, all of those components have to work together to be able to move these people around and continue this economic growth, so we can continue to send positive economic ripples through the rest of the country. It's a great point, and Mayor West, let me start with you. I think this needs to be a round robin. Um, you know, with a, something like this, talking about the positive effects, obviously, of Prop 400, and and as Maricopa County continues to be, if not the fastest growing county, certainly top three in the country, we saw, surprisingly to a lot of people, we are not even in mid-May yet, and at the legislature, looks like a budget is going to be signed by Governor Hobbs, and she negotiated with uh, Republican legislative leaders. There is concern that um, a Proposition 400 extension discussion has not formally occurred and since a budget is about to be signed um how nervous how frustrated are you considering what happened last session that we don't have something yet on the table for the governor to sign and this session when a budget is signed that's the job of the legislature to get budget done so uh, is there concern that this is not going to be taken care of during this session there needs to be a special session mayor west let me start with you but i'd love to have all of you uh give your input on that you know, I, I've been chairman of MAG, Steve, probably for almost for a year now, so 11 months. And what I've learned in this journey is that I ride the roller coaster, right? I don't get too high. I don't get too low. Um, and it, it has served me well. And I try and do that with our team at MAG. And there's an incredible amount of talent at, at MAG and the intergovs that help communicate that message to the legislators. Would I like to be further along than we are right now in this process? Yeah, I would. And, and just for everyone who's online, we have a meeting with the governor today. It's our second meeting in two weeks. We have a meeting with Senate leadership uh, after that. And my hope is that we can come to a consensus on, on this plan. Let's remember that the legislature only approves us going to um, the voters. This is not a this is not the legislature signing off on this. I, one of the other panelists touched on 72% approval for Prop 400. This plan, Prop 400E, is going to the voters once the legislature passes it and once the governor signs it. And I have no doubt that the governor is willing to sign it. She's been very supportive on this. Um, we appreciate her support. I will tell you that Chairman Cook has been a big advocate of this plan, and his leadership has been um, incredible through this entire process. Current polling, two different polls done by Arizona League of Cities and Towns and the Contractors Association puts this plan at 70% approval with all of its aspects. The voters deserve the right to vote on this plan and decide on their transportation and economic development future. Because let's not, let's not minimize what this plan is. It is a transportation plan, but at its core, it's an economic development and quality of life plan. And it's meant to serve all residents. 
to give you some scope of the um, interaction we've had on this plan since its beginning, and I've been mayor of Avondale for going on 2014, so almost nine years. We've had over 500 public meetings on this. We've had north of probably 12 to 15,000 people who have engaged on this process. We've had 27 cities and towns, three tribal organizations, and two counties who've been a part of this process. I, I think when we talk to the business community and stakeholders in this entire process, they want something done. They don't want to have any doubt about their economic future, especially with strong players in the market like Austin, Texas, and Salt Lake City, who are nipping at our heels to become a tier one city. To give them any advantage to minimize our impact on what we can deliver to the residents and to the business community, for me, would be a disaster. And that's not hyperbole, and that's not embellishment. It would be a disaster for for the uh, residents and the business community of Maricopa County. But I would I would love to see what the experts say on this because I think I see them nodding their head and I think they're in agreement on what I'm saying. So, Sandra, let me have you jump in on that next. Well, there's so many things to respond to right now. <laughs> um, so uh, Mayor Weiss is, is absolutely correct. I attended a GPEC meeting yesterday where they did an overview of what's happening in the Austin market. And one of the things that they are doing is really concentrating on uh, transportation, mobility. And this has been a key um, competitor uh, for, for uh, the Phoenix metro area or, or you know, Maricopa County. And so they are looking into all these things right now. They're, they're investing in light rail. They're doing all the things that I think we have gotten a jump on. And we need to continue that momentum because they are still, they have still edged us out over the past um, you know, a couple of, of decades. Um, and so we, we're really still needing to keep um, keep our 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 uh, foot on the pedal. And um, I do think, you know, the the we're not as far along as we'd like to be, but I think we're we're fortunate that we have two legislators that have um, introduced bills, um, both um, um, Senator Cook and uh, Representative um, Livingston. And so that's really important that, uh, you know, we know that we have um, some strong interest in leadership, but I think Mayor, Mayor Weiss said it correctly, is that the legislature at the end of the day, they're not, uh, they're not sending this to the voters. And the voters at the end of the day, what once it goes on the, once it gets past this hurdle and goes to uh, Maricopa County to, to the Board of Supervisors and put on the um, on the ballot, the voters are really the ones that are going to speak. And um, Mayor um, uh, John Lewis actually reminded me of the the numbers. You know, we're, we've talked we've talked about the polling on this plan being um, excess in excess of seventy percent. But I'm going to go back twenty years ago. Um, I worked for the city of Surprise back then, very conservative community, um, was not sure how we were going to, to, to fare, how our voters were going to, to end up weighing in. Over 65% of the voters in Surprise in that time frame, so 20 years ago, back in 2004, over 65% voted in favor of Prop 400. I know, and, and we've talked about this, uh, about the economy the, the residents changing, um, the median age in the West Valley today is 34, 34.6 years old, technically. And it's a younger population. And it's a population where we know national trends is that younger people are getting their license later on in life. So they, they absolutely need um, options like transit to get around the area. Microtransit's important, not only for our younger folks, but also for our seniors that are having a difficult time getting around. And so really that, that need to serve uh, those communities are, are extremely important. Um, and then I, I can't not mention SR30. That is a key mm. component for the West Valley that is tied to this plan. If we don't get this plan uh, passed, uh, and moving forward, we don't have a shot at SR30. That is one of the key um, projects, not only for the West Valley, for Maricopa County, but for the state of Arizona. Buckeye has attracted so much um, uh, high-end um, uh, employment in that area, and, and uh, the Southwest Valley cities are doing the same thing. And that is key to getting uh, service uh, goods pro, um, trucked from the uh, from the ports of Cal uh, California, from the ports of Long Beach and LA through to other parts of the country. 
they're not going to, again, if you look at a map, they're not going to um, come into LA and drive to San Diego and then, you know, take I-8. They're going to go on I-10. So SR-30 is a key project for us. And we don't get there. We don't get these key projects unless we get this plan passed. And leave it to the voters. Um, again, I, I think the polling speaks for itself. John Lewis, not to ask you a more loaded version of this question, but do you think that the legislature and Governor Hobbs will get together on this to give voters the chance that that Sindra has talked about and that Mayor Weiss referred to the percentages of 70 plus percent support for this kind of thing? Because it does seem like one of those that really just should have gotten done because it's not, in terms of transportation, yes, there are certain points that Sindra made about maybe conservative folks want something, maybe more progressive folks want something else, but they all want transportation of some form and this extension makes that possible. You have a sense that there's four individuals or panel members that are very passionate about this. And with great enthusiasm, those who are listening, we're reaching out to you too to, to know how important this is. I don't believe we have an option. We have to get together. And, and yes, there's good dialogue uh, that, that's occurring. Representative Cook, we've appreciated his stakeholder meetings that we've attended. and this just has to happen. And part of the four of us, uh, we're celebrating the remarkable achievements of the last 40 years. And we can talk about what's happened and, and the great things. I, I had a chance um, with Mayor Wise to serve as a mayor of Gilbert from 2009 to 2016. And in that role, companies that were coming to the Valley would give feedback that our transportation infrastructure was outstanding and allowed them to consider Arizona, and we need to keep it that way. Something that, that Todd referred to, and, and Mayor Weiss too, the, the population increases. Um, 1980, we go from 1.5 million in the Valley to 3 million at, at the year 2000, to 4.5 million at the year 2020, and 300 new residents are coming to Maricopa County a day, and so we need to prepare for the future. And so part of Steve, just one more emotion I give is that with Mayor Wise firsthand, I had a chance to be part of the Maricopa Association of Government process. Now, 2009, when I started as governor, uh, when I started as mayor, I didn't really fully understand the process. But then I could see that 27 mayors in the valley and some of our Indian communities and and uh, county leaders got together. We brought all of our individual needs for our communities and we put them together to look at what we would need for the future. And it was inspiring to see how as a team, we saw that for the entire Valley to be successful, we needed to do this, this, and this, and we prioritized and went forward. And as Mayor Weiss said, that happened again for this plan for the future. And, and so it's been local communities coming together to say, this is what we need. And that's why, again, to your specific question, Steve, we have to make this happen. And that's why the four of us today with great passion, we're reaching out to anyone we can listen to. Uh, the last few months with our legislature has been uh, very positive in that the dialogue that has gone forward have, has brought up a lot of good things to consider. And, and so it's, it's been good dialogue. And, and it will continue. And so I'm very optimistic and hopeful that we will get to that point. Todd, how much do business leaders want to make this happen as soon as possible and not have to worry about a special session or anything like that? Well, yeah, they, you know, the business community obviously always looks for sort of consistency and predictability. Um, and uh, obviously we would love to see this signed and, and, and done this year. It really is important. There is a significant cost to not doing something. Um, if we had done this last year, for instance, State Route 130, um, about $100 million less. So that's a significant um, penalty for not getting anything done. But I, I do caution against um, being too pessimistic. I'm with, I'm with John. I'm an optimist. I call me Ted Lasso of the group. Uh, I think <laughs> I think there's a way. And, and you know, you've seen one legislature, you've seen one legislature. So um, I'm now I'm going to contradict myself and say, you know, go back to when this was done 20 years ago. This wasn't easy back then. I was on staff. I remember uh, John Halikowski, our, our ADOT director, was was the, the analyst. And we had Andy Biggs was the transportation chair. 
uh, no fan of a lot of this stuff. And it got through um, because I think he saw the merits in uh, doing something that would make a difference economically. So we have um, a while to go. We um, have not, uh, there's been no call to Sunday die. I'm glad that, the, that uh, the Mayor Weiss and others are going to meet with the governor today. I think it's important for all of us in, in the, the rest of the community, let the legislature know uh, how important this is, uh, because now they have time to focus on this. It's not without precedent that we have passed a budget and then, and then look to pass other important pieces of legislation. So I still think we're in a good place. I'm with, I'm with, uh, with John. I think that um, we're, 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 I think, poised to move uh, this, this bill through the legislature and get it out to the voters next year, uh, next year, I believe. Okay. Well, Mayor Weston, Centra, I want to start with the two of you on this next question, because Centra, you mentioned uh, Representative Livingston. We also heard about Senator Cook as well. So let's talk about what those dueling plans may look like right now and, and, and what it appears there, um, I don't want to say should be in this plan, but what is going to be different about this extension as opposed to what we've seen with Prop 400 before in terms of what the priorities may or may not be vis-a-vis -vis freeways versus public transit? So. Um, so Oh, go ahead. You, you go, Mayor. You go first. So, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of committee meetings, Steve, on, on both plans. And, and, and both gentlemen have worked really hard to bring plans forward that they feel serves the community. One of the criticisms of Prop 400 was that the money for freeways and roads and transit was put into buckets, put into silos. And it wasn't easily, it, it wasn't allowed to be moved back and forth depending on what the needs were. So we all try and be, for, uh, you know, seeing into the future, um, but it's difficult to look 20 years in the future. So we took the criticism from Prop 400 and we said to Prop 400D, let's build in some flexibility. So if future needs lean in one direction, we can move money to accommodate that. We also don't know what future technologies look like. If someone would have said to you in 2004, hey, in 2023, we're gonna have vehicles that drive themselves. You're going to go on your cell phone and you're gonna pull up and a stranger's gonna pull up in front of your house and you're gonna get in that stranger's car and they're gonna take you somewhere. We would have all scoffed, right? It's where we're at today. I don't want to predict what technology looks like for 20 years from now, but I wanna make sure that we are ready for that technology. So I think the priorities for Prop 400E are are freeways and roads. Over 60% of this budget goes to freeways and roads, right? The remaining 40% is, is transit and some flexibility in the plan. And we need to have a balanced plan. And that's what Prop 400 gave us. And Prop 400D is also balanced. And, and I'll give you a very important reason why. Sintra and John and Todd have talked about economic development and getting workers where they need to go across the entire valley. Not every worker has a car. Not every worker can afford gas and insurance. Uh, we, just got, we just got updates from RPTA. In 2020, 2022, 32 million people rode transit to get to work, to get to doctor's appointments, to get to school. Out of those 32 million, almost half of them were going to, to work. They would have no other option. And I hate throwing a lot of statistics out at you, but 67% of the people who ride transit every day have no other option. What is the plan for them if we don't have transit in this plan? And the truth is that the priorities still focus on freeways and roads, but to have a balanced plan, we need to have transit in there. So I think you're seeing um, a very balanced effort on this. And again, almost 15,000 people we're stakeholders in this process, and they said this is the plan that we want. And I think it's important to point out that 60% is $9 billion. That's not an insignificant amount of money, uh, to your point, Mayor. Well, no, and, and honestly, when you look at this, Todd, and, and you know this, I mean, when you look at the contribution from the federal government, that contribution is almost $16 billion toward this plan. I don't know where we'd come up with that other $16 billion. It's a 20-year plan. It's, it's a half a cent sales tax. And it, for me, you had, and John touched on this, you had 32 entities that have their own priorities who came together and voted unanimously for this plan. Residents scream for a fesh, efficient and effective government across all government levels. They scream for it. It's what they want. 
32 government entities came together and said, we're going to work together. We're going to compromise on issues. And we're going to give you a plan that you can support and that you ultimately can vote on. And that's where we're at with Prop 400E. Hey, Sintra, go ahead, please. So I, Mayor captured it um, perfectly. So I, I'm going to tell a story. Um, we at Westmark, we've been working in the workforce development space for the last seven plus years. And part of that, we went to meet with a company in um, uh, that uh, that hires um, uh, formerly background individuals or people who have been in prison and and um, you know have now come out of prison, and um, so we're we're having this interview on you know workforce and who do you hire, how do you hire background individuals and so on, how are you adding them to your workforce, and the uh, the owner of the company told this story about an employee that he had that lived in Chandler. Um, and rode his bike four hours a day each way. So eight hours on a bike from Chandler to his location in the West Valley to get to work because that was the only way he could do that. He did this every single day until he was able to, you know, work there long enough, save up enough money and buy a truck. So those are real life stories. And we didn't get that story looking for, you know, what's going on in, in transportation. We got that story looking you know, finding out about what's happening in workforce and how can we get there. So there's so many of those stories that I've heard throughout the years of us working in the workforce development space that really connect getting employees to work, making our economy stronger. It all feeds on one another, you know, getting people out of um, poverty and so on. So it really, it's a, it's a human story. So we've been talking a lot about economic development and transportation and, you know, investments and all of that. But I think it comes down to really mobility for people, getting them around this area in the modes that they need to. They might not want to drive a car. They, you know, they might they might want those those uh, freeway opportunities like we have in in uh, with SR30. But they might also be, you know, older people that you know are not comfortable driving a car, so they they want to do the Uber. They want to do the micro transit. Um, there are students that I spent some time working with Glendale Community College, and they said the, the the president at the time said she stood out in the entry area, and she was shocked at how many students get to work via Uber. Uber. They don't want to drive. They don't want to invest in the car. They don't want to buy the gas. They don't want to do any of that stuff. But they Uber to school every single day. So the needs are greater than I think you know we even know. To Mayor's point is. There are so many things that are unknown to us because we live in our own worlds, right? And we're making decisions based on our own experiences. But there's so many different elements of uh, transportation and mobility that are out there that are really uncovered. And flexibility gives us that opportunity to adjust to the, the changing needs in the future. John Lewis, could I just point, add sorry, uh, a comment? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. I, I was just going to say that the allocation of our transportation funds is is really into three major buckets of freeways, arterial streets, and transit. And Prop 300 that was passed in 1985 was almost 100% allocated for freeways. That's what we needed then. That was the need. And in 2004, the Prop 400 uh, was still primarily freeways, but quite a bit of arterial and transit. And now what's being proposed for our next 20-year extension is a mixture of the three with less freeway, but still quite a bit and more arterial streets and more transit. And that has to do with what was just discussed is the changing needs. And as Mayor Weiss said, this process of what's being proposed was hundreds of meetings and thousands of citizens giving input about what the needs are. And so for the future, to give us that economic development engine to continue and options for our citizens and the 300 new citizens coming here every day, uh, we do need that flexibility. And, and that's why I think as a group, I go back to, we are very passionate about this. Well, Mayor Lewis, I think it's interesting that, uh, I mean, obviously the Valley is, is big. Um, and I think about here's a former mayor of Gilbert and a current mayor of Avondale talking about, yes, maybe their communities have somewhat different goals, but at the same time, when it comes to transportation, perhaps an obvious question, but how much of a difference has it made to 
have all these expansions and make it feel like going from the West Valley to the East Valley is not a chore. I remember as a kid here in the early 80s, it was quite a chore. Let's plan the whole day because we don't know how long it's going to take. And you can get, it just creates efficiencies. It also um, creates people coming together a little bit more, it seems, because going East, East Valley to West Valley, North Valley to South Valley, it just isn't that big a deal anymore, thanks to Proposition 400 money and some of these, these advances. Mayor yeah. Lewis. Oh, thank you, Mayor Lewis. Um, yeah, I, I think transportation connects the valley. It connects the valley in a business sense, but it connects the valley in a social sense. Mm -hmm. So let's use a freeway that I use quite a bit. And that is the 202. I hop on I-10, I get on the 202 heading east, and I go to Chandler and Gilbert. From my house in Avondale to John Lewis's neck of the woods is 20 or 25 minutes. Would I ever go, would I spend an hour and a half going to Gilbert and Chandler, as wonderful as those communities are, but they are not the garden spot that Avondale is. But, <laughs> right, love you guys, but, but it goes reverse people in Chandler and Gilbert who may never come to the Southwest Valley because it's too far of a drive, it, they will now come and experience Avondale and Goodyear and Glendale and, and Peoria and all those communities that are the heart and soul of, of, of the Valley. And I think it is a business connection, but it's a social connection. And it's not only freeways, but it's transit because the system has to be built for everyone, Steve. It does. And Prop 400E delivers on that promise, which is we will provide the ability for people to get where they need to go in a timely manner. And, you know, John talks about the Intel facility and everything else. Let's talk about, let's talk about Buckeye that is having core power come out there with a million square foot facility. Uh, initial uh, investments is 3000 jobs, but they're building to 13, 15, 16,000 jobs as new vendors come in. Those people, they may not have the ability to, to buy a car and go there, but transit's going to play a role, a huge role in, in Buckeye's future. It's going to play a huge role in Queen Creek's future and Peoria's future and all those communities that make up the valley. John, and, and jump in on this, because I know that as you're a mayor of Gilbert, you really had a lot of that planning going on in Gilbert. Yes, the connectivity that Mayor Weiss just mentioned um, has brought us together for business and social purposes. And the term I used a few minutes ago was remarkable. And I continue to just see the great benefit of all of the feedback in the Valley coming together. I was in Queen Creek last night in the early eighties, Queen Creek was a few hundred people. And we went there to get fresh corn and it was wonderful. And now Queen Creek is one of the fastest growing communities in the Valley and to the East in Pinal County is Santan Valley that has another 120,000 residents that are taking jobs in Greater Phoenix, and they need a way to get around. The priority for Queen Creek in the proposed plan uh, meets their local needs, arterial streets and SR24. And we go to every community that is part of the next 20 year plan, they have given input about what their needs are and it's part of the plan. And then the big picture is to continue to give connectivity in various means. And so it's, it's a very positive a projection of this wonderful investment that we've made the last 40 years of looking ahead of what can happen in the next 20 years. Todd, one of the you things know, that strikes me, go, go ahead, Senator, please. I, I was going to say, um, you know, we talked a lot about the, the benefit of the Loop 202 and the connection with the Valley. So going back to, you know, the crystal ball that we had in, in 2004, while a part of the community, Phoenix, obviously saw the benefit of Loop 202, in the West Valley, we were really focused on Loop 303. We wanted that connectivity um, to in a, in a different area. However, like Mayor Weiss pointed out, all of a sudden, Loop 202 has really opened up um, uh, tran uh, transportation time and commute times for us. And now it's connecting the valley in 20, 25 minutes, probably 25 minutes in, in traffic in the morning. So back to that crystal ball, there are things that that will that will receive the benefit from in the future that we're not even envisioning today, hence the need for flexibility. And Steve, let me before you go to Todd, let me Todd, let me just expand on that because when we talk about cutting down on commute times, right? The ability of someone in Chandler to work in Avondale or someone in Peoria to work in Gilbert, cutting down on those commute times means increased quality of life. So that mom or dad who's going to work can still 
come home in time to spend time with their kids. They can still go to those soccer games or baseball or volleyball games, whatever they look like. And it really is, it cuts down on their time that they spend in traffic every day and it builds on their quality of life. And it enhances our ability to attract quality talent and quality companies from across the nation when they look at our schools and they look at our transportation and they look at the quality of life and they said, you know what, that's where I want to live. And that, that's as important as the transportation and the economic development part of it. So I'll put you on the schools, spot for a sec. Yeah. Stronger schools and stronger communities. That's what this does. Absolutely. It, it, Todd, when it comes to, I know we think about the, the businesses that you talk to that in the Valley, maybe those who are thinking about moving here. Um, if we were to rank things are, is, our, uh, our education or schools or neighborhoods and transportation all tied for first or is is transportation in some ways eking out ahead because of how large this valley is and the importance of being able to to live in a place and, and maybe work nearby but maybe not well it's an important factor um, when we're talking to businesses the the biggest challenge they've got right now is workers right they there are there are more jobs than people um, and they're, they're the next question is how can I get people? into work. Um, they want to make sure that we're, we're, when they're going to be in Phoenix, are there, is there a way for them to get folks into work, whether it's, it's a freeway, whether it's an arterial, whether it's rapid transit, that is, a, that is a big factor. And most of these CEOs that are coming here are coming from places that include all of those. They're used to having that mix, so they're kind of spoiled. Um, and the other thing we got to think about is um, one of the, the most important things for us to do here uh, I know it's great to bring companies here. That's a big deal. But 70% of all new jobs are created by existing companies. Um, and you can bet that the places like Austin, where our, our good friend Glenn Hammer is now, um, are, are trying to get companies to leave Phoenix, to move to other places where they have these kinds of options to move people, which means you can move people to jobs, which makes it attractive for employers. So I think we have to think about it in a, in a way that's not just like, how do we attract companies here? But how do we keep companies? And remember, 70 to probably 80% of all new jobs are existing companies. If we want them to grow here and stay here, we need to make sure that they have the ability to move people around. And, and, and like the mayor said, I mean, it's, maybe it's an extreme example, but there are people that go from the East Valley to the West Valley and vice versa to go to work. Um, and we need to make sure that can continue to happen. Steve, well, on the education uh, comment you just made, I think of a wonderful new facility in downtown Mesa, the Mix Center, the ASU Mix Center uh, for media and film production, probably one of the finest facilities uh, like that in, in the country. And that happened because of the light rail connection between the Tempe campus and Mesa. And that's just another great example of business education, a community coming together with a positive result. Mayor Weiss, you alluded to this a little bit before, but I want to make sure that uh, if the extension is sent to voters, which we all anticipate, and we're going to keep Todd Sanders' optimism going forward there, um, how much quote-unquote local control is there for each community? For example, if, a, if Buckeye wants to do something different than Chandler does, uh, is there the ability for generally the funding is for freeways, arterial streets, et cetera. But if a community is not obviously having light rail, for example, it, is there, uh, are there going to be details that you would like to see? Will there be details that voters can decide and it'll be a little bit more community focused based on each individual city? Yeah, absolutely. So when MAG was putting together its plan uh, for Prop 400 e we talked about arterial, arterial streets and, and transit. And one of the things that we did was go out to each community and say, okay, give us your priorities. And what does this look like? And I, I will give you an example. Uh, in Avondale, there was a uh, Thomas Road does not go over the river. So there's communities on the east side and the west side of the river bottom that are disconnected and they have to either go to McDowell or Indian School Road. One of our projects was the Thomas Road Bridge. That was input from our community to say, okay, this is a priority for us. One of the big ones, and I think it's a great example, if you've ever driven on the 303 out to Surprise and you have to get on US 60 going to Vegas or anywhere else along that corridor, what you see is you see a bottleneck at that stop. And Surprise and their residents put together a plan and said, how do we make this a more, a smoother transition? in the Prop 400E plan is a transition to smooth this out. 
you look at the SR24 and what does that look like as you're getting off the SR24 and you're going by the sports complex there, what does that transition look like? And that was input from local leaders and local residents in their community. The big part of Prop 400E that where you get a lot of input is on the transit plan. Not every transit plan from each city is, is the same or should be the same. So Sintra has mentioned microtransit a couple of times. Avondale and Goodyear combined on a microtransit plan, which is a hybrid between an Uber type uh, transportation vehicle and, and public transit. It costs $2. And we went together on that. That has been incredibly successful. So successful that Surprise is now working to adopt that. There's flexibility in that plan through RPTA and the leadership there of how do we how do we work with communities to find out what's best for them. And I said this yesterday, I was on the Glendale Chamber of Commerce policy uh, Zoom call. And I said, this is not some group sitting on high saying, this is what you're gonna get and that's it. Those decisions come from the local community and feed their way up. And again, efficient and uh, efficient government and, and one that is accessible to the community is what you want. And this is what this plan delivers. We just have a couple of minutes left. So I want to give each of you a chance to say something. If you either reiterate what you've already said or something else. And, and uh, Sintra, let me start with you. I, you know, I think I would just uh, leave everyone with the, 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 point, the point that this is definitely a quality of life plan. Um, Mayor uh, Weiss actually triggered my memory. I meant, again, I mentioned that we're that we've been in the workforce space for uh, for a number of years, and um, a lot of our residents are spending a lot of time in traffic, and that really it, it affects the time they can spend with their kids, uh, that they can um, you know volunteer in their communities. We've been delivering these messages on the workforce side for a number of years now, but that really you know getting people closer to home. Um, uh, increasing jobs closer to home while we've seen a, a number of years ago when the uh, Loop 303 uh, was completed, uh, local jobs uh, were created by 40% in that area and bringing 40% of, of uh, local residents into those jobs. So we know that with increased um, investment in State Route 30 um, would, would also do that same thing. Again, the, the uh, things that Buckeye has lined up it will, you know, bring high paying jobs to that community. Transit gets us around. Um, so it all really, this is about quality of life. And I think that's what our residents deserve. And they deserve an opportunity to vote on this. Mayor Lewis, to you. Steve, I think the three summaries that I've been saying, the return on investment of our transportation investment of in the last 40 years has been remarkable. And we look at the positive economic development impact that too has been amazing. And so the third point is that we need to continue that investment with 300 new citizens coming to Maricopa County every day. We need to continue and we encourage all of us to come together and make it happen. Todd? Well, I, I would just say it's, it's kind of like back to the future. If you wanna know what the future is gonna look like, you've, you've gotta look at the past and what we did 20 years ago and, and obviously further back than that, have led us to where we are today, the fastest growing county in the country. So my, my, my I, I would just say, I wanna to call to action, reach out to your policymakers, let them know why this is important to you, that you wanna to continue to have this economic growth. And by the way, you just wanna have an opportunity to vote on this question, azledge.gov. If you don't know who your legislators are, go on azledge.gov, you can find out who they are, just give them a call and no need to rant, please. Um, but if you can do that, send them, a, send them a note and let them know that you want to see this on the ballot. Mayor Weiss, last word to you. I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for being here today. My, mine is a tale of two stories. One is we can look at the past and see the success that we've had. And again, transportation, economic development and quality of life success. And how do we build on that for the future? And that's what Prop 400E does. The second part of that story is a scary story. Um, there's a gentleman at MAG, his name is John Bullen. And John is outstanding in what he does, but he tells the scary story of what economic development and quality of life looks like without Prop 400E passing. And I will tell you that it is a scary story. And the final thing I would leave for everyone is, this is ultimately up to the voters and the legislature and the governor. I'm gonna be optimistic like Todd is, um, Ted Lasso moment, 
the legislature and the governor, we need them to get behind this plan. The governor has iterated it that she is. Many legislators have, have to champion this plan, but this plan ultimately goes to the voters and they should be the ones to decide on their future. That is Avondale Mayor Ken Weiss, Chair of the America Cup Association of Governments Regional Council. Also with us today, Cynthia Hoffman, President and CEO of Westmark, John Lewis, President and CEO of East Valley Partnership, and Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Thanks very much to the Arizona Capital Times for presenting this morning's scoop. Thanks to all of you for taking part. Thank you to all of you who watched and listened to us. I'm Steve Goldstein. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.